Today, we hope to have a panel discussion as well as questions from the floor and questions online. And so to kick off, I'd like to introduce briefly our speakers. So first online, we will have Dr. Yvette Isar, who is a legal advisor at the ICRC in Geneva. She will first present on the project itself and its methodology, as well as certain substantive issues in relation to questions of detention. Following Yvette will be Dr. Lawrence Hill Cawthorn on my right, Associate Professor of Public International Law at the University of Bristol. He will respond in relation to the question of challenging one's status as a POW, touching on the interaction of different bodies of law. After Lawrence, we'll hear from Andrea Raab, Legal Coordinator at the ICRC in London. And if it's not too parochial, a former student of mine and Duffo's in international law and armed conflict from five or six years ago. Sorry, Andrea. <laughs> she will address some specific questions of disability and gender arising out of the convention. And finally, Professor Duffo Okonde, Professor of Public International Law here at the Blavatnik School, will respond and deal with some questions of treaty interpretation. We will then have discussion and questions from the floor. So to kick off, over to you, event online. Thank you so much. I trust you can hear me well, and I'm just going to throw up my slides. So um, bear with me while I figure out the Zoom. I, don't, I find I'm not able to share my screen. It's working now. Give me a second. Yes, that works. Brilliant. I think the panel will all move so we can see the slide. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, yes, um, I'm really pleased, um, really pleased to be here on behalf of the Commentaries Update uh, Unit of the ICRC's Legal Division to kick off this launch event for the updated commentary on the Third Geneva Convention. And we just like to really thank the organizers from the outset for making it possible for us to do this event. And I'm very sorry that I couldn't be with you in Oxford, I'd, I'd have loved it, but I'm glad that um, we're able to do this this way and very happy to, to see that our colleague Andrea is also there and Andrea was also a part of the commentaries update unit. So we are there with you very much indeed. Um, I'll just um, sort of go through an outline of what I hope to do today. Um, I wanted to start out with a bit of project background and methodology, and that's what uh, Miles set out. But what I will, what I, because I think we can go through a lot of the methodology and some of the questions and answers. I want to talk a little bit about the process and the workflow, because I don't think this is something that um, we ever get to write about or read about. So I'd like to give everyone in the audience, just a bit of a sense of how these commentaries get produced. And then we'll move into some of the questions on, um, on substance. So between uh, Andrea and myself, we'll talk about material conditions of detention and also issues of gender and disability. So I'll be treating um, the topic number three that's on the slide there, material conditions of detention. And instead of giving you a catalog of rules that are contained in the, in the third convention and the commentary, um, we thought we'd talk about principles that run through the convention and that informed the drafters as they put together this really important piece of, um, of, of international humanitarian law. So without further ado, I'll go into the, the sort of process and workflow. Um, but just to say, in, by way of background, um, after the Second World War, states came together and drafted the four Geneva Conventions, and the ICRC was part of the drafting process, and we were there during the negotiations, um, as a result of which, um, in the 50s, we put together the affectionately known Pictet commentaries to the, to the four Geneva Conventions. Uh, Jean Pictet was the general author, uh, uh, general editor, sorry, and not the sole author of the, of the initial commentaries. And, um, they, they continue to bear his name. And 70 years later, after these had been published, the ICRC, as the promoter and guardian of IHL, 
we felt we wanted to ensure that our commentaries remained up to date. And so in 2011, we began a project uh, to update the commentaries as uh, of the Geneva Conventions, as well as AP1 and AP2. Um, so we launched the updated commentary on the first convention in 2016, on the second in 2017, the third in 2020, and we're working right now on the updated commentary on the fourth Geneva Convention, which is slated uh, to come out in 2024. Um, and as I said, we can talk perhaps in the question and answers about the methodology and the project background more in detail, but let's look a little bit today, um, at, at the workflow. So I'll just give you a little introduction to the project team. The team is headed by Dr. Jean-Marie Hankerts, who many of you will know very well, um, and is composed of six additional legal advisors, myself included, um, and we are supported by three fantastic legal associates, as well as uh, um, we have administrative support. Now, the project team, uh, and that's the core of the project team, and the project team is hardly working on its own. We rely on um, internal and external contributors, and internal contributors refer to other legal advisors within the ICRC's legal division who have uh, relevant subject matter expertise. We also rely on colleagues in the house that have uh, technical expertise in other areas, for example, nutrition, detention, child protection, et cetera. And not all of these persons are sitting within the legal division. So we're consulting widely within our division and across the house. But we also rely on contributions from a wide array of external contributors who help us in different capacities. And I'll go through that um, a little bit in, in the next slide. Um, but all I'd like to say at the outset that none of these external contributors are working for remuneration. And uh, we really want to take every opportunity that we can to thank them for their invaluable cooperation. Without external contributors, we would never be able to produce um, the updated commentaries. Uh, and a little bit now about our process, if I wanted to talk about this. So our methodology is based on the on Articles 31 to 33 of the 1969 Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And that uh, those articles set out sort of a range of items that we need to make sure that we touch upon to be sure that we're offering proper interpretations of treaty provisions. So every draft commentary begins with a very um, detailed background research document that attempts to touch on all of these different elements of the Vienna Convention of the Law and Treaties to make sure that we're looking at all the things we're meant to be looking at um, as treaty interpreters in order to pull together elements of, of the interpretation. So we look at state practice, case law, um, we're looking at doctrine, we look in the ICRC archives, and we're also consulting legal and just ordinary language dictionaries to make sure that um, we are capturing the ordinary, ordinary meaning of the terms um, accurately. So we put together these very comprehensive research briefs and then the initial author, the author responsible for the draft commentary puts together an initial draft. And then the dra that draft goes through the life cycle or the pipeline of the commentary. The first step in the life cycle of, the, of, of a drafted commentary is the reading committee. And the reading committee is composed of all contributing authors to that commentary, which means that every author is able to read the contributions uh, that will end up making up the whole commentary. We read each other's work and it's a really important step because it ensures that people across the commentaries are reading each other's work and able to identify interlinkages where they exist so that um, the, the commentary as a whole is coherent and one body of work. After the reading committee has submitted comments, the draft is fed through to the editorial committee and our editorial committee is um, composed of three internal ICRC members and three external, uh, three external editorial committee members. Um, the three internal ICRC committee members are Cordula Droge, who's the head of our legal division, Niels Meltzer, who's the director of international law and policy at the ICRC, and Knut Dorman, who's currently uh, head of delegation in Brussels and uh, who was the former head of the legal, um, uh, legal division at, at, at headquarters in, in Geneva. Now, once 
the written round of comments from the editorial committee are processed, the draft is then prepared for peer review. And the peer review stage is extremely important. We gather for each convention uh, a geographically representative group of practitioners and academics from all corners of the world to review the draft commentaries in their personal capacity ahead of publication. So for, uh, for GC3, some 50 practitioners and academics from all corners of the world were asked to contribute as peer reviewers. And the same method is now being followed for the fourth convention. It's important for us to know that 50% of peer reviewers roughly are um, military and they make sure that the commentary goes through what I like to refer to as a reality check. Um, the comments from our peer reviewers from all uh, what, whatever sort of stream they're coming from makes sure that the wording of the, of the, of the draft commentaries is really carefully studied and that we reflect as many diverging opinions, diverging views as possible, um, and that we just have a very rigorous and thorough, um, I, I think I would say just very bigger, rigorous product at the end. It's been through very, very many safe pairs of hands. The feedback from the peer review round, once that's processed, the draft is ready for then a second round of editorial committee review, which takes place face-to-face. -face. Um, and at that stage, comments are discussed, comments that come from the peer reviewers are discussed and any outstanding issues are ironed out. And then the feedback from that meeting is uh, processed and the draft is then moved into finalization phases that I won't get into too much at the moment. Um, since we're uh, at the UK launch, I just want to make sure to thank the persons that were involved in helping us through the conventions put, uh, put together the updated commentary. So for the first convention, peer reviewers inc uh, include uh, Charles Garraway. And on the reading committee, we had Professor Robin Geis, Mr. Michael Meyer, and Professor Sandish Sivakumaran. For the second convention, our peer reviewers were Mr. David Jardine Smith, Professor Stephen Haynes, Mr. John Granger, and Professor Robin Geis. And on the reading committee contributing, we had Mr. Michael Meyer and Professor Sandesh Sivakumaran. For the third convention, uh, as peer reviewers, we had the late Professor Peter Rowe, Brigadier um, David Neal, Brigadier Vivian Bach, with a lot of assistance from the persons that are listed. I won't go, I won't read them all, unfortunately, for time. And Professor Francoise Hampson. And on the reading committee contributing, uh, again, Colonel Charles Garraway and Professor Sandesh Sivakumaran. And now for the fourth convention, um, peer reviewing, we have Brigadier Keith Epler and contributing on the reading committee, Colonel Charles Garraway, Professor Sandesh Sivakumaran and Dr. Marco Longobardo. Um, we couldn't do this without, uh, without all of those individuals and their help. And we'd really like to, to thank them for their efforts and for helping us produce the updated commentaries. So as you can see, that was just the UK involvement. Um, the updated commentaries involve an unprecedented level of outside involvement. We have drafters, reviewers, um, editorial committee members um, um, who currently work for or have worked for governments and militaries. And now, as I say this, I realize I didn't let you know who the external uh, editorial committee members were. And I'll quickly just name them. Professor uh, Marco Sassoli, um, who is a professor at the University of Geneva, Judge Lisbeth Leinsat, who is a um, former news, um, Netherlands government and currently a judge at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and Wing Commander Tim Wood from the New Zealand um, Air, uh, Air Force. Um, and with all of this external involvement, when we say that it's the ICRC updated commentary, that doesn't capture the extent of the collaborative process. And that's simply what I want to, want to highlight. Um, producing the updated commentaries is a heavy exercise. It involves lots of in-depth review. And we undertake to go through this exercise in, in as serious a manner as possible in order to be as reliable and complete as we possibly can. Just to give you an example, for the third convention, we processed over 10,000 drafts with valuable feedback from our peer reviewers and each one of their comments really helped us produce um, a quality document. 
a final product of over 2,000 pages of in-depth guidance. It's our sincere hope that you will engage with this product so that together we can guarantee um, the, the better treatment for prisoners of war, wherever they may be. And now moving away from sort of that process and turning to some of the substance, I'd like to go into the issue of material conditions of detention, the time that's available to me and talk about principles. So in dealing with material conditions of detention, the principles that I would like to talk about include military necessity, humane treatment, and the principle of assimilation. And then later on, um, Andrea will talk to us about principles of equal treatment and non-adverse distinction as related to gender and disability issues. Now, IHL seeks to find a balance between military necessity on the one hand and humanity on the other. And this is uh, certainly the case of the third convention as well, which is built on this understanding uh, that you can see in Article 21, in line with the principle of military necessity, a party to the conflict may intern the combat forces of its adversary. In other words, the principle of military necessity permits the internment of an entire category of persons during international armed conflict. And the same principle also informs the rules regarding their release, which is when military necessity no longer justifies their internment. Um, so it, it's clear that prisoners of war are interned to prevent them from returning to the battlefield. And for the duration of their internment, therefore, captured combatants should not be considered criminals because of their participation in the conflict. Internment is a different regime than criminal detention. Um, and the treatment afforded to prisoners of war must satisfy the overall requirements of humane treatment, which is set out in most clearly in articles 13 and 14 of the third, uh, of the third convention. So we'll just read them together. Um, article 13.1, prisoners of war must at all times be humanely treated. Article 14.1, prisoners of war are entitled in all circumstances to respect for their persons and their honor. The principle of humane treatment is anchored in this very fundamental understanding that the inherent dignity of human beings is inviolable. And several rules follow directly from articles 13 and 14. For example, that prisoners of war must be protected against acts of violence, protected against intimidation, insults, public curiosity, physical or mental torture, and reprisals. The conventions don't define what humane treatment means. And so the commentary provides further guidance on what this obligation entails in the context of specific rules. And we do this by looking into the practice of states as found in military manuals, in codes of conduct, in policy documents. One thing that we state very clearly is that the obligation to provide human treatment can't simply be equated with the prohibition of inhumane treatment. The obligation to afford humane treatment includes all prohibitions on any inhuman or degrading treatment, but it goes beyond simply requiring the detaining power to abstain from subject, subjecting prisoners of war to inhuman treatment. And often the principle requires positive action from the detaining power. It's also important to note that the type of treatment required by the principle is context specific. So what constitutes humane treatment um, may depend on, on a wide variety of factors, including a prisoner's cultural background, their social or religious background, their gender or their age. So what's humane treatment for one prisoner may not necessarily constitute humane treatment um, for another. And the principle really informs every aspect of life for a prisoner of war, from the moment they're captured to initial questioning, evacuation to the rear, and the conditions to which they may be subjected throughout the duration of their internment. And the drafters made sure that more than 100 provisions of the convention translate this uh, overall requirement of humane treatment into more specific areas, such as food, clothing, hygiene, medical care, and contacts with the outside world. And all of these provisions um, underpin the protective framework of the convention, and they confirm that the, the detaining power must um, respect the inherent human dignity of prisoners of war. And these links with humane treatment and the specific rules, if we, take, we took great care to make them evident in the updated commentary so that 
the red thread of humane treatment um, can be seen throughout all the rules of the commentary as, yeah, this is central to the ICRC's work since its inception um, to, to promote the humane treatment of prisoners of war. Um, so that's, that's all for humane treatment for the moment. Um, and now I'd like to talk about the principle of assimilation, which flies, I mean, the principles of military necessity and humane treatment are rather well known. And the principle of assimilation is one that flies under the radar a little bit. Several rules of the convention make reference to it, and I've just thrown up Article 82 on the, on the slide, which we'll get to later. The principle of assimilation, what is it? It reflects an understanding that prisoners of war are to benefit from living conditions similar to those that are enjoyed by the detaining power's own armed forces. So the, the treatment afforded to own forces is, the, is, a, is a standard, is a starting point. And this logic was already present in the 1899 and 1907 Hague regulations and also in the 1929 Convention on Prisoners of War. Um, the principle of assimilation is particularly important in the chapter of the Third Convention that deals with penal and disciplinary sanctions. And for the purposes of that chapter, the principle is articulated in Article 82. So we can see there that um, the, the slide reads, a prisoner of war shall be subject to the laws, regulations, and orders in force in the armed forces of the detaining power. And this means that the principle of assimilation has a practical value. It facilitates the task of administering the internment of prisoners of war, since the detaining power is called to apply rules and standards that are already in force for its own, its own troops. The detaining power is therefore necessarily familiar with these rules. It has pre-existing experience of implementing those rules and standards and can readily apply them to prisoners of war. And um, there, there are several rules in, in GC3 that refer to this principle of assimilation as the starting point for determining living standards for POWs, but the principle doesn't operate in a vacuum. It operates in conjunction with all these other principles that we're talking about today, including necessity, including humane treatment, including equal treatment and non-adverse distinction. Um, but if we take simply the interplay between assimilation and humane treatment, we can sort of see how this works in Article 25. Uh, which addresses conditions for the living quarters of prisoners of war. And Article 25, we'll read it together. Um, prisoners of war shall be quartered under conditions as favorable as those for the forces of the detaining power who are billeted in the same area. The said conditions shall make allowance for the habits and customs of the prisoners and shall in no case be prejudicial to their health. So there you see in the first part of the rule reference to um, assimilation. So uh, the standards that are in force for the national forces of the detaining power. And the second part of the sentence refers then to minimum standards that are required by the convention, um, which is why the second part of that rule requires the detaining power to make allowance of the prisoner's habits and customs. And then you have this really strong minimum safeguard, in no case be prejudicial to the prisoner's health. And we can also see this in um, the articles, sort of the rules on penal and disciplinary sanctions. In particular, if we look at Article 84 on court, you have in Article 84, one, the, um, the reference to assimilation. And here it reads, a prisoner of war shall be tried only by a military court unless the existing laws of the detaining power expressly permit the civil courts to try a member of the armed forces of the detaining power in respect of the particular offense alleged to have been committed by the prisoner of war. So in short, 84, one, assimilation. And then 84.2 continues, in no circumstances whatever shall a prisoner of war be tried by a court of any kind, which doesn't offer the essential guarantees of independence and impartiality as generally recognized, and in particular, the procedure of which does not afford the accused the rights and means of defense provided for in Article 105. Um, so with respect, these are just two examples to show that with respect to the rules that invoke this principle of assim assimilation, National standards are taken as a starting point, but when or if the, the treatment afforded by a detaining power to its own forces 
on these matters falls short of the minimum standards that are set out in the third convention um, and which often refer to the principle of humane treatment, then it's those conventional standards that apply to prisoners of war. There are a couple of interesting cases where uh, it's been, it was difficult for us to really set out what, is, what a simulation means for certain categories of persons, um, but perhaps we'll get through, get to those in the, in the question and answer session for the sake of time. Um, and I just wanna thank you for your time and for being here uh, with us as we launch the updated commentary on the third Geneva Convention. Thanks a lot and look forward to questions. Thanks very much for the presentation. So I will now hand over to Lawrence who will respond. Lawrence. Thanks. Um, so I was just going to speak um, briefly on, on a, a kind of substantive point. Um, and the, the particular issue I wanted to talk about was the ability to challenge your identification as a, a prisoner of war and, and challenge your, your internment that, that automatically flows from that. So this is something that has, has kind of um, uh, been an issue, particularly in a lot of contemporary conflicts in the first Gulf War, in, in Iraq after the 2003 invasion, Afghanistan. Um, there's been, and the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia in particular, there, there's been a, a lot of a lot of individuals detained on the premise that they are enemy combatants, pr prisoners of war, and therefore subject to internment. So as, as a bit shown under, under Article 21 of the Third Geneva Convention, there's this, this presumption of automatic internment if you, you qualify for that, that status. Um, the, the kind of premise in a way of, of the Third Convention is that this is a good thing to be labeled a prisoner of war. Um, it brings with it a kind of wealth of protections that you otherwise wouldn't be entitled to. Um, and therefore, the presumption is that you would want to assert your POW status, notwithstanding that it brings with it this automatic internment. Um, but we know that, that in contemporary conflicts, many people are, are detained as POWs, as I said, but, but want to challenge that. They want to challenge that, that internment. So in the, the third... Um, convention commentary, the position taken is essentially that the tribunal that is provided under Article 5 of the Third Convention, which is basically a tribunal before which you're actually meant to try and assert your POW status. The assumption for Article 5 is someone has been denied prisoner of war status, but they want to assert that status. And so a competent tribunal, an administrative tribunal, not a court, is set up to, to, um, to adjudicate over that. Um, the ICRC's position in the Third Convention is that this competent tribunal under Article 5 should also be employed um, for those who want to challenge their status as a POW. So not those who want to assert it, but those who want to challenge it and challenge the, the, the um, consequent internment. Uh, and this is something that a number of states have actually done in practice, particularly in the last 30 years or so. They've sort of used these Article 5 tribunals to, to hear claims by individuals detained as POWs, but who want to challenge that detention. So slightly differently from, from what Article 5 was originally intended to be. What's interesting in the, in the, the commentary is that the language here is quite um it's it's not it's not particularly forthright so it, it suggests that um and i'd be interested to hear if, if this was actually the view it suggests that it, it's not necessarily a kind of legal obligation to do this but that it should be done so so to quote the, the commentary, it says a competent tribunal may also be engaged when a person asserts that they are not a prisoner of war, a situation not addressed in the convention. A person who asserts that they do not fall under any of the categories of Article 4 and who has not committed a belligerent act prior to falling into enemy hands may thus seek to contest their POW status and in turn. A competent tribunal should assess such a claim in the same way as it would a claim to POW status. So it's not entirely clear whether it's intended as a, as a sort of interpretation of Article 5 or rather just a, a sort of recommendation as to, as to sort of an extension of Article 5. Um, 
in many ways, I, I think we can, it, it seems like the, the correct direction of travel. I would in fact argue that I think we could be a bit more assertive about a legal obligation to provide some kind of review for those wanting to challenge their detention. Um, there are obvious policy reasons for wanting to do that because POW status can carry with it very, very lengthy internment. If there's no opportunity to challenge that, there's obviously a risk of long-term arbitrary um, and wrongful detention. Um, it's also the case that state practice, as I said, has kind of shown a sort of growing willingness and acceptance to provide some kind of review mechanism for those wanting to challenge their status as prisoners of war. Of course, a lot of the time that comes with the caveat that it's for policy rather than legal reasons, but nonetheless, it wouldn't represent a sea change in, in practice itself. And I think most importantly, and why perhaps the ICRC could have been sort of a bit more forthright in asserting a legal obligation here, is that I think recognizing a, a legal right to challenge your status as a POW and challenge your internment fits quite well with the kind of gradual crystallization of rules that we've come to recognize um, as governing uh, detention and armed conflict. So on the IHL itself, the ICRC ha has sort of long recognized that we can kind of see this, this general arbitrary deprivation of liberty prohibition under IHL, that, that the arbitrary deprivation of liberty is inconsistent, for example, with that humane treatment principle that Yvette referred to, what, what was referred to as the light motive of the entire conventions. Um, but most obviously, we can also see this as consistent with international human rights law, which we've obviously come to kind of recognize as being applicable in armed conflict, um, at least as a, as a general rule. One of the difficulties here, though, is that the ICRC's um, methodology on, on how it takes account of human rights law is, is, is also a bit sort of um, uh, temperamental, I suppose, in a way. And I think that's partly because they obviously don't want to suggest that every rule they've interpreted in light of human rights law, because it would then um, carry a, a kind of automatic critique by those states that don't consider human rights law necessarily, necessarily to be applicable in armed conflict. Um, but it, I, in looking at the ICRC commentary, interestingly, this is one example that the introduction of the ICRC commentary refers to, where actually human rights law is, is sort of set aside by IHL. So the ICRC commentary in the introduction says, in the event of a real conflict between particular norms, resort may be had to the principle of conflict resolution, such as lex specialis, by which a more specific legal norm takes precedence over a more general one. The clearest example of such a conflict is the fact that IHL provides for the internment of enemy personnel who qualify as prisoners of war under the third convention based solely on that status and without court review of the lawfulness of internment. On this particular point, IHL differs fundamentally from human rights law and in armed conflict, the specific regime for POWs under IHL takes precedence. So that's actually suggesting that those general human rights norms on um, detention are largely either set aside or modified by IHL. But actually that's not entirely consistent with the practice of human rights tribunals. In fact, I'd say it's completely inconsistent with the practice of human rights tribunals. So if we look, for example, at the European Court of Human Rights, um, to the extent that you can sort of distill uh, clear reasoning from a number of the, the key cases here, we can at least see in Hassan, for example, that there's a, a considerable emphasis placed on the continued operation of the right to court review of detention in the background. So it seems like the European Court of Human Rights would be quite reluctant to read down the European Convention to say that there's no ability to challenge your detention um, in, light of, in light of the Third Geneva Convention. Um, we also saw in the Georgia-Russia case, again, a, a kind of a, a sort of typically um, deferential judgment to states on this particular point, um, the court was still uh, keen to say that Article 5, the rules on detention, continue to apply in armed conflict. Um, and similarly in international criminal law as well, 
we can see international criminal tribunals recognizing that the presumption of civilian status isn't just a rule that applies in the context of targeting, but it's a rule also that applies in the context of detention, so that you can't simply assert POW status as a basis for detaining someone. You almost have to rebut um, the presumption of civilian status when detaining them, just as you do when trying to target them. And therefore, if you can't rebut that, the ordinary rules governing civilian detention under the Fourth Geneva Convention apply. Um, some case law in UK courts actually supports this. In the first um, full Iraqi civilian litigation trial in the High Court, um, the judge in that case, uh, Justice Leggett, as he then was, addressed this particular point about the ability to challenge your detention as someone detained as a POW. And interestingly, he actually read the Hassan case and other UK jurisprudence as suggesting that under no circumstances can you read down the European Convention to the point where we say there's no ability to challenge your detention, that even those detained as prisoners of war under the Third Geneva Convention are entitled to the kind of review mechanism that civilian internees are entitled to under the Fourth Geneva Convention. So there's quite a lot of uh, growing recognition that it can never be possible to read down fully to this idea that there's no ability to challenge or review your detention, as at least appears on the text of it, the Third Geneva Convention would suggest. Um, now, none of this is to say anything also about the set of rules that we have under domestic law with respect to habeas corpus. I won't go into detail on this, but under English law, um, for, for a long time, the position of the UK Ministry of Defence has been that there's no right to habeas corpus if you're detained as a POW. Actually, the assumption was that it's, it's jurisdictionally barred for English courts to, to hear a claim for habeas corpus. The UK Supreme Court rejected that argument several years ago um, in the Al-Wahid case, in which uh, Lord Sumption, of all people, uh, actually held that there's in fact no jurisdictional bar to habeas applications, even for POWs detained abroad. Um, so in many ways, this is sort of an area where I think you almost have to have a kind of appreciation of rules from a number of different sources, whether it's IHL, human rights law, international criminal law, domestic law, and it, it almost gives a slightly imperfect impression of the law if you just look at one of those sources without taking count of, of the other sources. I'll leave it there because I don't want us to drag. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Andrea. Good evening and um, thank you for having us tonight. Um, also from my side, a huge thanks to Miles and Dapo for, for having us. And if I may also be a bit parochial, it's really wonderful to be back. Thank you. <laughs> um, so tonight I will discuss how the Geneva Conventions deal with persons who have specific needs or face distinct risks. So conceptually, we'll be talking about equal treatment and non-adverse distinction. And maybe to say at the outset that I also had prepared a nice PowerPoint presentation. And um, however, in the interest of um, brevity and not making things too complicated, I think we'll go without it. So as mentioned, um, we'll look at how the Geneva Conventions deal with um, the principles of equal treatment and non-adverse distinction. And I will center talk to showcase how these principles operate. I'll center on two uh, diversity factors, namely gender and disability. So I'll start out with gender. And to start out with basics, we need to think about what do we mean by gender? And gender can be defined to refer to an aspect of a person's socially determined identity, which, which relates to femininity or masculinity. So, Gender is perceived of as a social construct. It's non-binary, so gender is a spectrum. And it's distinct from what we understand as the biological sex. So whatever is biologically determined. Now, the second question you might ask yourself at the outset is why do we need to think about gender in the first place? Why is this even a big thing today in the 21st century? So, Let's go back to the drafting history. 
1949, the drafters of the Geneva Conventions already recognized that distinct categories of persons need special protection. And they specially protected or provided protections for women, children, and the elderly. Now, um, Yvette has already explained to us that the first set of commentaries were drafted in the 1950s and 1960s. And those special protections by, were, were informed or how they were interpreted was informed by gender perceptions and gender norms as they prevailed at the time in the 1950s and 1960s. And obviously, since then, our perceptions of, un, of gender norms has changed quite a bit. Let me give you an example. Article 14.2 of the Third Geneva Conventions requires to have due respect for um, the female sex. Now, the way in which the Pictet commentaries thought about this or interpreted this was to say that three considerations have to be taken into need to be taken into account, namely the honor and modesty of women, childbirth and pregnancy, as well as women's weakness. Indeed, the commentary perceived of or called women the weaker sex or the weaker gender. So you can see how it was necessary to update the commentaries in this respect. And that's really what the ICRC did. We mainstreamed gender considerations throughout the commentaries. And in doing so, we took into account today's understanding that the experience that women, men, girl children, boy children have in armed conflict and detention particularly is distinct and they're facing distinct risks. So for women, for instance, the risk can be physical or it can stem from political, economic, cultural or social structures within a society. So for instance, women may face the risk of sexual violence. So based on these risks, we thought or we mainstreamed throughout the commentaries considerations of the specific needs women, girl children, boy children, men may have. Now, let me also say that this is really something that reflects reality. Women are more and more um, part of the, of, of the combat function. They take on combat functions much more these days, but this is not a novelty. And that's important to understand. Women have already participated quite a bit in World War I. So in taking into account female or women's needs or gendered needs more specifically, the commentary also reflects the reality that the battlefield is actually getting more diverse. Now, we thought about the definition of what is gender, and we also considered why it's necessary to take that into account. So now let me turn to how the actual commentary and the Geneva Conventions themselves deal with this. Now, we need to distinguish two sets of norms. Those norms that in and of themselves already take into account gender, so if you think about Article 25, which um, Yvette showed us earlier, which is about quarters, there is one specific sentence in that provision that actually takes into account or requires that women have their separate dormitories, separate to men. So this is already a gendered article, if you like, but that's not the case throughout the commentaries. And that's why one specific provision is particularly important, and that's Article 16. Article 16, which we don't have on the screen right now, consists or gives us basically three points. And first, it speaks about equal treatment. And so it requires that all prisoners of war are treated equally. But importantly, that does not mean that, but that's how the RCRC interpreted it. It doesn't mean that they have to be treated in a manner identical, right? But it means that in treating people differently or treating different categories of persons differently, it's necessary that this is premised on uh, substantively different uh, situations and needs. So therefore it can also be warranted in order to treat people equally, to actually treat them in a differentiated manner, which brings me to the second point, um, non-adverse distinction. So the, in Article 16, for instance, it's, it says that generally you have to treat people equally. You have to treat POWs equally. But you must also, or but it's also okay if you treat, if you give grant privilege treatment to people on the basis of their 
um, rank, for instance, or on the basis of their professional background, their age, and so on and so forth. So there is actually an exception in there. And that's exactly what we're talking about, non averse distinction. So if it's justified um, by virtue of a person's distinct situation or distinct needs, it is actually okay to treat them differently because only through differentiated treatment do you then obtain equal treatment. But at the same time, Article 16 also prohibits adverse distinction on the basis of race or nationality, for instance. So it's not okay to treat people, POWs, in a, way, in a differentiated manner merely because of their race or nationality. So really, this particular provision was the basis for the ICRC to mainstream gender throughout the commentaries and to also think about gendered applications of gender neutral articles, for instance, when you think about clothing, the fact that women should be provi provided with um, specific clothing, um, per se, that article, Article 27, is not gender specific. However, by virtue of Article 26, you can interpret it that way. Similarly, the requirements to provide adequate medical care, by virtue of Article 16 and Article 14.2, this is to be read. Uh, so as to encompass an obligation to provide gynecological care, for instance. Now, one more point on this before I move on to disability. What's important to understand is that this does not mean that women are less resilient or have less agency. On the contrary, it really means that the commentaries need to be taken or need, that the Geneva Conventions need to be interpreted in a way that allows to take into account specific needs of specific people taking into account how the prison population might, or the prison, the POW population might look like. Which brings me to my second point on disability. Now, Article 16 is gender neutral in and of itself. It does not say that you have to, that only this, this equal treatment obligation applies to women and men, but it actually allows for more diversity factors. So, and this was then also the basis for the ICRC to take into account um, persons with disability. Now, you might ask yourself, what could a person with a disability potentially do on a battlefield? And that was um, the stance that the Pictet commentaries in 1960 took. They didn't, they, when they perceived of or considered a person on the battlefield, they were thinking about an able bodied man. They were not thinking about a woman, and they were certainly not thinking about a disabled person. Now, the ICRC this time around really took a very different approach, a much broader approach and based on the social model of disability. So this means that there is a mismatch between a person and their specific or an a specific environment. So it takes into account that a person might be completely, perfectly able, if you place them in one environment, it might face difficulties in another environment. So and that's then for us the basis to um, have mainstreamed disability considerations throughout the commentaries, again, with a view to equal treatment and non-first distinction. And perhaps I'll stop here. Um, and thank you for your attention. Look forward to the Q&A. Thanks very much. Thanks. Andrea. Hey, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be hosting this year. And thank you to the ICRC for coming to launch the third convention here. I always think it's useful to do a bit of show and tell. You know, it's a bit like going back to, to primary school. So if I put up on the screen so the pictures of, of the ICRC's commentaries, and here is one of them. I actually don't have in paper, in hard copy, the commentary to the third Geneva Convention, but the it's not, you know, yeah, it's the, exactly the, the commentary on the second Geneva Convention. You can see they're quite chunky. They're very heavy, and the one to the first is just as heavy, and I suspect that given that the number of provisions in the third convention is about double that in the second convention, I suspect that the commentary to the third convention is more chunky than this one this one is. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about questions of treaty interpretation. So as Yvette talked about, these are revised or updated commentaries. So if you like, it's like a second edition um, to the ICRC's commentary, the first coming in the 50s and in the 60s. And presumably the point of an update, a revision, a second edition of any work, is to take into account changes in the field that's being studied 
and to make some changes to the original version of the work. And you see this explicitly set out in the introduction to the ICRC's updated commentary. So it says, the objective is to ensure that the new editions reflect contemporary practice and legal interpretation, and that the new commentaries reflect the ICRC's current interpretations of the law where they exist. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that in revising the commentaries, the ICRC has on occasion expressed a different view as to what the law is or expressed a different view as to how to interpret the Geneva Conventions from the view that it expressed in the first set of commentaries back in the 50s. But of course, the challenge is this, the text of the Geneva Conventions themselves have not changed between the, adopt, between the writing of the first commentary and this commentary. And so this raises a familiar question of treaty law, which is the question of, to what extent is it legitimate to say that a treaty means something today, which it was not thought to mean in the past? And if such a change in treaty interpretation can occur, what justifies that change? So what are the processes that justify um, a different interpretation of the treaty? And what I want to do in this talk is to, first of all, point to some examples of places where the ICRC in the revised commentary take a position as to the interpretation of the Geneva Conventions, which is at variance with the interpretation that was taken in the original version of the commentary. So where are some of those places of difference? Secondly, to explore how the ICRC comes to the conclusion that the law is different from what the ICRC said it was. And Andrea has already mentioned a couple of, of cases. So what kinds of justifications are advanced for this difference of, of view? And then third, with respect to the particular areas that I will consider to sort of assess whether those changes in the position are, are justified. So the three cases that I want to examine are three examples of interpretations of the common articles to the Geneva Convention. So some of you will be familiar with the fact that the first few provisions of the four Geneva Conventions of 1949 are common to each of the four conventions, or to all of the four conventions. So we refer to them as common article one, common article two, common article three. So I'm gonna make, I'm gonna talk about three cases. And I'm sure there are other cases, Andrea has already mentioned them, some of them, where the ICRC takes a different view in the 2020s to the view that it took in the 1950s. So the first example that I want to talk about is the definition of an international armed conflict. And this is important because it's a gateway to the application of the Geneva Conventions itself. So the Geneva Conventions of 1949 apply, with the exception of one provision, they apply to international armed conflict. And the question is, what is the test for determining that an international armed conflict exists? An international armed conflict is a conflict between two states. But what happens when a state uses force on the territory of another state against a non-state armed group. To what extent does that give rise to an international armed conflict? So you can think about many cases, you know, the US, for example, using force in Syria against ISIS, does that give rise to an international armed conflict? That depends on how one interprets common article two to the four Geneva Conventions, which speaks of, and I'm quoting now, an armed conflict which may arise between two or more of the high contracting parties, even if the state of war is not recognized by one of them. Now, in the previous version of the commentary to Common Article 2, there appeared to be a suggestion that for there to be an international armed conflict, you needed the involvement of the armed forces of two states. So the example that I gave, the US acting in Syria against ISIS with four out of them. And the 1958 commentary, it says, that an international armed conflict is any difference arising between two states and leading to the intervention of members of the armed forces. That's what the 1958 commentary says. But the latest version of the ICRC commentary takes a different position. In fact, they engage explicitly 
with the position they'd taken in 1958. And the ICRC says that the position in 58 would mean that for an armed conflict to exist in the sense of common article two, you needed the simultaneous um, involvement of two opposing states. And they say this is too narrow. So according to the updated version of the commentary, they say an international armed conflict is a conflict that arises whenever one state uses force against another state. And they say that whenever a state uses force on the territory of another state without its consent, that is against that state, even if the purpose is to engage and to fight a non-state army. So that's one example of a change. Second example of a change is also one of these gateway provisions, the definition of occupation. So um, under Common Article 2, the Geneva Conventions apply in their entirety to situations of occupation. And the previous version of the commentary, this is really actually the commentary to the fourth Geneva Convention, had suggested that the definition of occupation for the purposes of the fourth convention was different from the definition of occupation that we had in the Hague Conventions, the Hague Regulations, which preceded the Geneva Convention, so the Hague Regulations of 1907. And the Hague Regulations say that territory is considered to be occupied when it is placed under the actual authority of the hostile army, so where if there's effective control of that territory. But the ICRC in its previous commentary had said the word occupation in the Geneva Conventions had a slightly wider meaning. It didn't mean the same thing. And so, for example, they said if a patrol goes into enemy territory, even without any intention of staying there, it must respect the Geneva Conventions in its dealings with civilians that it meets. And presumably the same thing would occur if it happened to, to encounter members of the opposing forces and take them into custody, then presumably the POW Convention will not be engaged. But the latest commentaries again take a different view. They state that the fourth convention builds on the Hague regulations, but does not replace it for the purpose of defining the notion of occupation. So even though the previous commentary had suggested it's a new meaning, the present one appears to suggest that actually no, the definition in the Hague regulations is the exclusive definition of occupation in IHL and applies. So that's the second example. The third one um, is in Common Article 9 of the Geneva Convention, from Article 999, and it's 10 of the fourth Geneva Convention. So this is a provision that deals with the provision of humanitarian services. So Common Article 9 provides that the ICRC and other impartial humanitarian organizations can offer their services to the parties to an armed conflict. But that provision goes on to state that the right to actually undertake those humanitarian services is subject, and I'm quoting now, subject to the consent of the parties to the conflict concern. So you can offer services, but you can only actually implement that subject to the consent of the party. And the question, the parties concerned. And the question that arises is which parties, which states are concerned? So if you think, for example, of the provision of food in the context of an armed conflict, if that food has to come from territory of one state, pass through the territory of other states to end up in the place where the food is to be provided, which states are concerned and need to consent? Is it just the place where the food is to be provided? Or is it all the states where the food has to pass through? The 19... Um, the commentaries from the 1950s suggest that the party concerned just means the state, sorry, it, su it suggests that it means not only the state from which the assistance comes, all the countries that it passes in transit, and then also the one where it arrives. So that's the suggestion. But if you look at the commentaries, the more recent ones, it actually takes a narrower position of concern. It says concerned means for the purposes of this provision. It says it just means actually basically the destination state. So the state where the assistance is going to be provided. I'll come back to the reasoning that is given. 
So that's the question. So those are three examples of changes. And as I said, not surprising that in a second edition, an update revision, you will find changes. The question is what justifies those changes? And I think those three examples, because there are three different justifications that are given. And there's a fourth that I hadn't actually thought about for which Andrea's talk uh, brought to mind. So one possibility is to say, look, the position that we adopted previously is not correct. And so that's just a straightforward change of position. You say, look, we sort of rethought it and this position that we took before, we don't actually think is the right one. And I think that's what the ICRC was doing with respect to Common Article 2, when they say, look, the position in the 1938 commentaries, of course, the new commentaries, they're very upfront. They say it's too narrow. And so they have a, a different interpretation. So that's just not a, it's not a case of evolution of interpretation. It's just saying we take a different view as to what we think the position now is. Second case, the one relating to the definition of occupation, the ICRC suggests a new interpretation actually based on new case law. So they suggest a new interpretation based on the case law of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and to some extent, the ICJ. Which is interesting because on the one hand, you look at you know, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties and the, what it says you should take into account in treaty interpretation, it doesn't include case law. But that's not to say the ICRC is wrong. If you look at Article 38 of the ICJ statute, it speaks about judicial decisions as subsidiary means for the determination of rules of law, so ways of identifying rules of law. In effect, that's what the ICRC has done there. And I think in Article 38.1d, there's nothing to suggest that the law it speaks of there does not include treaties. I think they are subsidiary means for determining what the right interpretation of treaties are. This is allied a little bit to, I think, the ICRC also rethinking the, the intention of the drafters. The third example is the one that I think is the most interesting. So this is the Common Article 9 example, where essentially the ICRC interprets the Geneva Conventions in the light of a subsequent treaty, the additional protocols to the Geneva Convention. So they say, look, we take into account subsequent practice and use that to interpret what the Geneva Convention means. Now, of course, this is correct. The Vienna Convention provides that you look at subsequent practice in the application of a treaty as a way of interpreting the treaty. What's interesting here, though, is that the subsequent practice they are using is another treaty, Additional Protocol 1, most of whose parties are parties to the original Geneva Conventions, but not all. And so questions arise as to, can we do that? Can we use AP1 to interpret the Geneva Convention? Now, I actually think in principle, yes, I think we can use the negotiations of AP1 and establish agreement as to what the Geneva Conventions mean. I have my doubts about whether it's actually correct in this particular case, but I think in principle, yes. The fourth example, or the fourth justification, and I'll stop there, which I hadn't actually thought about until I heard Andrea speaking about, is where you just have new facts. You have new facts which you hadn't really thought about, or new facts which maybe they did exist, but they just cast a different light. And I was thinking about what you said around disability in particular, where it may have been the case that at that time, there weren't many people with disabilities on the battlefield. Now you have many more people, so new facts might mean that to it, in effect, what, what are we doing there? We're looking at the object and purpose and we're saying to accomplish the object and purpose in the light of these facts, we need to give this interpretation. But it's very interesting, I think, what the ICRC is doing here, just for international lawyers in general, to say how does treaty interpretation evolve and how do we justify coming up with new interpretations to treaty texts that haven't actually changed? Thanks, Tom. I think we have a round of applause. So we have questions. One question that I have is how I will see the questions online. <laughs> Sam, I don't know if you can hear us uh, backstage. We're sort of wondering how we will see, see the quote. Is it Fred? I'm talking to the people who are planning the AV. Hopefully there's somebody there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're not quite sure how we will see 
online yeah, questions. Oh, oh, excellent. They put them on the screen. Great, thank so you. Maybe we can start in the room, though. Some questions could be for any of the panelists or just in general comments. Judge Moran. <clears throat> Let me start with uh, the very interesting question of possible challenge to POW status. Now, uh, um, I am looking at this question more as a practitioner than a theoretician. From the theoretical or academic perspective, the question that you raise, namely the possibility of challenge to POW status, is, um, is a very interesting question in which I think we have to reflect because you have raised some very serious issues. As a practical matter, you, you, this is quite unlikely to come up frequently. And let me try to explain that. If you have a POW status and you think of options or alternatives, if you could get as the status of a civilian who is not accused of subversive activities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, yes you are tempted to challenge your POW status, which would enable you to be detained for a very long time. But this option to move from POW status to a status of quote, sort of a legitimate civilian is not very likely to arise. And in the typical case, the alternative would be to move from POW status to some kind of internment. Now, if you are a civilian intern, in fact, the protections which you get from international humanitarian law are far less. You have mentioned rightly the indefinite duration of um, POW detainment, detention. But if you are a civilian detainee uh, uh, accused of uh, or detained for reasons of some kind of alleged uh, subversion. Again, the problem of duration would be there even in the very worst way. Um, let me present this in the historical context. Uh, and Philippe, you know probably more and more about it than I do. During the Second World War, the invasion of Poland uh, triggered the detention as POWs of something close to half a million of Polish POWs. Sweden at that time had something which nowadays has fallen largely into desuetude, status of a protecting power. I don't know how Nazi Germany managed, but it must have been some kind of collaboration of Sweden and direct pressure on Polish POW, POW, but hocus pocus, a year or a year and a half later, all the Polish POWs became civilian detainees. They, in fact, became slave workers in Germany. So the temptation to waive a POW status is a tiny bit problematic. Now, the question that I found uh, extremely interesting and which follows on some of the issues that DAPO raised was um, changes in, the, in how do the protocols, uh, sorry, commentaries affect interpretations of the Geneva Conventions which existed earlier. Of course, the commentaries, the new commentaries started, I believe in 1916, it's nearly 70 years after Picte, and during that period of time, a tremendous amount of practice has accumulated, and therefore the, the new commentaries are so very, very rich. I was thinking, I'm curious about things perhaps that we have not discussed. How do the commentaries deal with it? One of them perhaps is premature for discussion, and that will be for Article 4, of, of Geneva Convention number four. Protect, to be a protected person under the language of the convention, required to be of a different nationality than of the capital countries. Now the jurisprudence of the ICTY very clearly and very consistently 
establishes that it is enough to be in the hands of an enemy adversary, adversary without necessarily having a different kind of passport. Now that's one, one uh, example. Another example, which arises in the context of the current commentary, is uh, how do we treat intra-force crimes? Traditional Hague law and Geneva law require that intra-force crimes are not subject to international humanitarian law. They're subject to inter internal criminal law. Now in Nitaganda and subsequently in Katanga, the ICC changes this approach and the uh, ICC, sorry, the IC, uh, ICRC in the commentary gives ICRC validation to that. It's a very interesting thing, thing which probably fits into some kind of progressive development of international humanitarian law, but I see some problems with it. And I do not yet know what will be the reaction of states. Will states not say, in fact, the protections we offer under through our courts martial and under our criminal law are quite adequate. And the principle of complementarity, let us, let me remind you all, is one which is fairly limited only to the ICC. We do not have this principle in, in other ways. And um, so, uh, so these are the four methods for Geneva Convention for intra-force crimes and, um, and basically, uh, and also, and this is the third one, Article 118 of the third Geneva Convention. Under Article 118, there was a duty on the detaining country at a certain stage of establishing of peace or whatever to release the prisoners. In other words, you know the story about it, but the fact is that since the end of the Second World War, the practice on this exchange in the Gulf Wars and in Korea, and I'm wondering, I have not had time to look up our, the commentary to Article 118, but I wonder to what extent you are um, articulating this uh, new practice as modifying explicit language of Article 118. Thanks, Ted. So a number of questions. If I'd like the panel to take them all, but not everyone has to take every one. <laughs> so if you go first, then speak up. Does anyone want to lead off? I can. No, Point that you're right. Th thanks, Judge Maran. Um, so I, I think on this point about the kind of practical situation of, of someone challenging their POW status, I think you sort of get the get right to the point when you say it, it sort of depends on the circumstances of capture, doesn't it? Because if someone is captured having is captured engaged in a belligerent act, then Yes, they're facing this prospect of indefinite internment, but uh, if, if they're not presented with POW status, then they risk being prosecuted for engaging in a belligerent act. So that POW status has the, the sort of the, the stick of internment, but the carrot of combatant immunity. Um, so that's why the language in Article 5 of the Third Convention and 45 of AP1, which sort of updates it, speaks of people having committed a belligerent act, or, or I forget the exact language of each. Um, but the, the, the presumption there is, is right, I think, that actually it is advantageous for to get you know, combatant POW status. But the, the situation, the, the hard case is where you have these sweeping detention operations where some people are engaging in belligerent acts, but a lot of other people are sort of swept up in that operation. They're not obviously identifiable as combatants and therefore automatically POWs, but the, the, the sort of presumption is that they are in that same category as those engaging in a belligerent act. And that was the situation. I mean, as you know, in, in a lot of those cases in the ICTY, like Simic, where this sort of came up, the, the situation was that people had been identified through certain characteristics, like they were carrying weapons. And that was sort of presented as a basis for saying, therefore, they're combatants subject to intern. Um, so, I, but I think you're, you're right. I think, I, I'm not sure I, I totally agree, though, that 
that a, a civilian under the fourth convention is far less protected than a POW under the third. Um, I think there's been a, a, a degree of um, uh, convergence over the years between those levels of protection. The exception, again, being where someone has actually committed a, a belligerent act. Philip, did you want to come in? It's just to I think this issue really became quite burning. It was sort of post 9 11, when there were sort of categories first falling out of GC3. And then we would, of course, say, well, then so what? Then the following GC4. And then there were those that claimed you fall completely into a, a, a hole. And that's where, of course, uh, uh, these kind of clarifications were, were necessary. I would, I would probably presume that, that, that nowadays the issues you're raising are probably the most, uh, even more sort of uh, uh, acute in, in, in situations of non-international conflict where you have this rounding up of all kinds of, of categories uh, and, and where you know you do then uh, risk having uh, you know people who are all fudged together and, and and you do not have then the required processes to to go through but i think in the international armed conflicts it's it's probably lesser lesser cases due to the, the procedures that exist so. other comments from the panel on uh, Judge Perron's question or comment. I think I can just say something on Philip's point about interpretation in the light of new case law. I, I agree with you that this is this is uh, this is a challenge. So on the one hand, I think of course it's correct to take into account new case law, as I suggested, kind of thinking about the ICJ statute 38 d However, the the extent to which that new interpretation actually is to be regarded as valid depends on the persuasiveness ultimately of the case law. So, you know, simply because the ICTY, ICC, or even the ICJ has said something doesn't necessarily mean that as a matter of treaty interpretation, it is the correct interpretation. And states may take the view that despite the fact that the ICC has said this, or even potentially the ICC has said it, they may take the view that it's, it's sort of in, incorrect, and that's the kind of subsidiary means um, point. And then I, I don't know whether Andrea wants to take this, and obviously you can also comment on it, but the point that Judge Moran makes about Article 118, the issue of the obligation to release at the end <laughs> of, at the end of hostilities, so there are sort of two ways I think one can think about it. One way is to think about it by way of subsequent practice establishing the agreement of the parties as to the interpretation. So you say, well, when we look at the words of the Geneva Conventions, it appears to be X, but if we look at subsequent practice, the parties have agreed that it means Y. That's theoretically possible. I don't know if we have enough subsequent practice to say we have that agreement. The other way potentially to deal with this uh, is to say we interpret the Geneva Conventions in the light of other obligations under international law, which of course right. human rights, which of course the Vienna Convention also allows for that you interpret in the light of. That would of course then raise questions about the point Lawrence made, which is to say in another area, there's this suggestion that IHL is lex specialis and would prevail. And that would make it difficult to then take this view that in this other area, human rights should be used to interpret what the Geneva Convention says. Maybe I can go to the question on the screen from General Alex Taylor, Director of British Army Legal Services. So this is really for Andrea and Yvette. In terms of the met methodology adopted, is there a risk that the peer review may be perceived by some are somewhat Eurocentric. If so, might this impact on the extent to which the new commentaries are adopted globally? And maybe I can just add to that, could you say a little bit more generally about the work the ICRC does to do with internalization or bureaucratization in, across the world? So either Yvette or Andre. If, if, okay. And you can also answer the previous question. You may have had a good answer to that. Thank you. If, if I may start, and then maybe um, Yvette and, and Jean-Marie can complement particularly on, on Judge Moran's point on, on Article 118. Um, I'll start with this one. Um, so part of our peer review process is that we include uh, people from all over the world 
Um, so we would have peer reviewers from all four corners um, of, of the world who would be able to provide their views and who would be able to um, give also um, their perception of, of what the law is based on, on their uh, interpretation. Um, so I understand the concern, but the RCSC is taking active steps to avoid the perceptions as Eurocentric. And of course, then our uh, workforce is getting more and more diverse as well, um, which is also, I think, a point that, that um, I remember Judge Moron making a couple of years ago that um, the people who write the law, the people who write the commentaries, if they're diverse, then it's much easier to take into account different viewpoints. Um, so this is also something that, that we're making, that steps that we're taking inside the ICRC. And I'm sure we will we'll be able to um, expand on that a bit more. Um, but Judge Moran, let me, let me also come in on, on two points that you made. Um, first of all, I was thinking about the point um, relating to Nitagana and Katanga. So I think there is a big question about the nexus, but I would like to take that back to the context of GC3 and sexual violence within um, the prison population. And I think here, when we think about Article 13 of the Geneva Convention, and the ICRC has interpreted this, it has interpreted this to mean that there is also a requirement on the detaining power to um, protect against violence and intimidation. So instead of thinking about individual criminal liability, I'd like to take this to the point of state responsibility and ask um, or answer your question with another question. How do we think about um, positive obligations when it comes to violence and things that states ought to do or must do as a matter of law to prevent sexual violence and other violence from happening? So maybe that is also another way of, of thinking about um, this intra um, or is, as you called it, violence, um, and ask ourselves, what is what is the onus that's with states? And then, Dapo, one of the that's my second point. One one of the things that struck me was when you when you mentioned how courts um, or how the assets decided to courts and court decisions. And I think here, one of one of the thoughts that came to me was that I think. When we then look at the court decisions, I think what they purport to do, uh, particularly when we think about RCTY case law, is to restate state practice and opinion juries and extrapolate custom. So maybe one way of thinking about this is less suggesting that the actual court case makes law, which I think we all somewhat agree is, is probably a bit of a stretch, but about it, it states the law. And perhaps what we're trying to do is to think about the court decisions as authoritative when it comes to statement of what is the law today, rather than to say that the court decision in itself is the law. But Yvette, I don't know if, if you want to come in or, or Jean-Marie, if there is anything you'd like to add to this. I'll, um, I'll happily jump in. I've been really following this, the, the panel and the questions uh, that have been raised with lots of lots of interest. I um, I want to start perhaps just by um, saying, yes, they are chunky volumes and Dapo, you're absolutely right. Um, GC3 is double what you have there. They're, they're two, the print volume is, is 2000 pages long, roughly a thousand pages per volume. Um, and um, we also have them online so you don't have to clunk, schlep around um, 2000 pages of, of heavy, heavy commentary reading with you. Um, but on, on the questions and the, the discussion in the room is really about re these, these very interesting questions on treaty interpretation. And I, I liked the way DAPO articulated it, what justifies changing interpretation and going through the examples, the, the, the questions that were raised by, by Lawrence, by Judge Maron. Um, I'd like to say that well, DAPO, what you were talking about, and you sort of outlined these four, perhaps, avenues. Maybe there's one that is correction of, of a previous view. The updates are correcting a previous view. The second was an evolution of views based on new circumstances. The third is um, an updated interpretation in light of the development of another treaty uh, in IHL. We've also referred to Lawrence's example also uh, referring to developments in other areas of international law, 
um, the comments about um, the, the relevance of ICTY case law when it comes to the categories of persons that are protected uh, under the fourth convention. And then DAPA, you also re uh, referred to the situation of new facts, uh, new facts meaning new practice. And I think it's very difficult if we are trying to think about treaty interpretation, questions of treaty interpretation, to look at it from um, the sort of that front end, I think I would call it, the results. I think it makes a lot more sense to think about how we justify and how, how we can rest on um, solid foundations of interpreting uh, treaties by really looking at what the Vienna Convention of the Law of, of Treaties says. And we have rules, or rather articles 31, 32, and 33. And each of these articles have different elements. So in article 31, we're looking at good faith, ordinary meaning, object and purpose of the whole convention, subsequent practice established by um, the, the parties, other relevant rules of international law. Then we move to Article 32, where we're talking about subsequent practice in the broad sense, so not necessarily subsequent agreement, uh, subsequent practice establishing agreement of all the parties, which is difficult to come by um, in, in when we're dealing with the Geneva Conventions because everyone is a party. But Article 32, we're dealing with subsequent practice in the broad sense as the International Law Commission has confirmed, the preparatory work, international judicial decisions, and then doctrine. Um, and in order to be able to carry out a um, reliable interpretation, all of these elements are taken into consideration together. So it's not a question of looking just at the ordinary meaning and how that may have changed, but also linking that into the object and purpose, linking that to subsequent practice if there has been any general practice. Um, if there are other re relevant rules of international law. And I can tell you that we looked at so many other areas, not just the, the usual suspects of um, human rights law and international criminal law, but we're looking at public health law, um, the ILO framework conventions on, um, on labor, the WHO tobacco convention, there, and, uh, and also private international law, because there are elements, there are rules in the third convention that deal with um, the wills, sort of civil capacity, civil capacities of of prisoners of war. So when are when are wills valid? And so we have to look at these elements of private international law, and all of this um, is done together. Now, the process by which it's done is not probably not mathematical, um, and there may be elements where reasonable people would weigh different elements. Um, differently um, than, than maybe the ICRC has ended up doing it. But um, when, when, we, when, I, when I listened to the, the conversation in the room, I really wanted to just highlight that the main thing that the ICRC is trying to do is look at all of the elements of, that we need to take into account in treaty interpretation together um, so that we're not following sort of, are we correcting our view here? Is it an evolution here? Those are the results, the, 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 the results that we see um, after sort of going through the, the VCLT methodology. And we like to refer to it as a menu that you can't skip um, courses off. So you have to go through each of the courses of the, the VCLT methodology. So you have to look at good faith, you've got to look at ordinary meaning, object and purpose. And then together, once you've got all those elements of the menu together, it, may, it, it results in a meal that makes some kind of sense. Um, but so I'll leave it, I'll leave it there with, in terms of methodology because I felt like all of the discussion in the room was sort of coming back to this element of how can we reasonably justify what we, do when we're, and I say we, not just the ICRC, but all uh, international legal scholars uh, and people called to apply treaties, um, because we will all face the same questions. And, um, and I think that the most, at least for us, where we've come down is the most, um, the, the most reasonable, justifiable answers for us come in really resting on a solid understanding of the VCLT and really trying to 
to take into account all of these different strands of uh, of elements that it requires um, be followed to to make sure that interpretations make sense for the times. I'll stop there. So we have time for one or two quick comments or questions from the floor. Anyone else? I've got a question for practical yeah. applications so as a practitioner, I guess, um, to you, Andrea, is about um, ensuring the mainstreaming of gender is wonderful. Obviously, it needs to happen. But how do you do that practically when a lot of domestic legislation is either still a long way needing to be developed or might even contradict the interpretation by the ICRC of gender defined as such? Thank you. Um, I think. The first important comment to make is that we're very aware that our that the law needs to be realistic for states to actually be able to comply with it. Um, so I think that that's one of, of, of the considerations that's really um, that we're really mindful of. Now, um, how do we? What well, what is sort of the practical application, and um, and what if the law does not? Um, if domestic law contradicts and maybe take it a bit further, what if a state is not able to comply, right? Um, so to give you some practical application examples, right? Um, for instance, the way in which um, canteens are stocked, according to the commentaries, has to take into account gender. Um, the way in which, for example, women prisoners of war are provided with um, clothing has to take into account gender and then of course they need to be provided with sanitary pads and so on and so forth all of those things that women might potentially need now what if uh, national law contradicts this and um, I think there there is a general uh, rule whereby the fact that your national law obligation um, does not comply with your international law obligations is not a justification for breaching the international legal obligation so that's I think one point and then simply there is um, a conflict uh, between those two uh, legal regimes um, and you reach an international law which cannot be justified by virtue of um, conflicting national law. So that's that's one point. The other point is what if you what if you have a material disability or inability to um, comply with that international legal obligation. So again here, and our colleague Kruba Machak, who will be rather familiar to um, Dafo and Miles as well, um, wrote a very interesting blog post on this, but let me just very briefly sum it up. Um, material inability to um, comply with the international legal obligation does not mean, or does not absolve you from complying with it. It just means again, there is breach. Now, what is the interesting question is, what is the actual legal consequence of that? So does it mean, for instance, that you have to then release prisoners of war? So that's something to, to think about. So I think if, if, if I have to just uh, boil it down to a quick um, answer, um, the fact that a state can't comply with an international legal obligation does not mean that it doesn't have to comply with it and at the same time I think the the commentaries are really realistic in how they've discussed or how they interpreted um, gendered um, obligations on states in relation to juicy theory. Okay finally for me just to say thank you so much to BSG and to those who've been helping with sound and technology. Thank you to all of you for coming in the evening. And finally, thanks to our panel online and in person. Thanks, everyone.